Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today's Saturday, May 4th, mm -hmm. and I am interviewing Cheyenne artist Frank Sheridan as part of the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at Frank's home in El Reno. Frank, you specialize in beadwork and cultural items. You do ledger painting. You've won numerous awards, including the First People's Community Spirit Award. You have an MBA, you had your own store for a while, you're currently employed by the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribe in the Elder mm -hmm. Care Program. Yeah. So thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you for coming. I uh, consider it a privilege. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Lawton, Oklahoma, uh, August 27, 1950. I grew up in Kiowa country in Anadarko and I went to high school at Riverside Indian School. Prior to graduating I uh, dropped out of school um, like a lot of my peer group at that time and uh, there was a lady that worked at the BIA that was instrumental in getting me to go back. She saw potential in me and anyway she helped me go back and the uh, best thing I happened after I graduated was leaving Anadarko and I came up this way, and um, I can go on and on, so let's <laughs> go with your questions. <laughs> um, did you, brothers and sisters? I'm the last surviving sibling. I had, um, Johnny was a brother, he was a Vietnam veteran, uh, door gunner in Vietnam. He survived uh, uh, being shot down in a helicopter crash. I had another brother, he, he's gone, Philip Lee Botone. I had another brother. Robert Keith Botton, and I had a sister, Erin Lynn Botton. And I have a, a one full sister, um, Marion Hill. So it's actually me and my sister are the last siblings. What did your folks do for a living? Dad was an artist. My mother worked for the BIA for years and years and years. She worked in realty and as part of that she developed a uh, uh, research project involving Cheyenne genealogy from Sand Creek. She has the most extensive Cheyenne genealogy of any person who's done the research, volumes and volumes and volumes. What about your grandparents on either side? My grandparents, uh, grandmother was Fred, uh, my grand Mother was Dulcie Bushyhead. My grandfather was Fred Bushyhead. Um, Fred was primarily a farmer, laborer. Uh, on my mother's side, my grandma Lena was Kiowa. Her maiden name was Two Hatchet, and my grandfather John Sheridan. He um, was basically a laborer. He worked at the Old Clinton Indian Hospital as a uh, ambulance driver. And when the uh, a uh, program came along where one of the presidents put people to work, the CCC program, I believe he worked for that a while. And uh, he uh, spoke fluent Cheyenne, he f spoke fluent Arapaho. So you have some memories of... I have very pleasant memories of my Grandpa John and my uh, Grandma Lena. Um, really good memories. Uh, my Grandpa John's... Um, mother was pipe woman, uh, Hayonova in Cheyenne, and that's my hallmark. I've always signed my artwork, pipe woman. I've never signed my last name on it. The reason that I do that is because uh, pipe woman, this is her, she was known for her beadwork, for her craft work, and the things I do, the bags, the, the bow cases, the, the cradle boards, parfleshes, boxes, they knew the origins of them greater than I did. They had utility for them. And I'm basically through the work I do, I feel that I'm honoring her memory. As I do these things, I uh, talk to her spirit, her memory. I talk to uh, her father. Her father's name was Moore. He was a uh, uh, Cheyenne chief, he was an arrow keeper, and he was a medicine man. Um, what people don't know about Moore, in order to, to be arrow keeper, they say you have to be full blood Cheyenne. Moore was half Sioux. Moore's father's name was Eight Horns. 
Moore's mother's name was Iron Woman. Eight Horns was killed in the Black Hills uh, fighting gold prospectors. And when my mother was a little child, she developed a sickness during the winter, and doctors gave up on her. And my grandpa and his cousin uh, went after more an old open Model T, bringing back um, this cut grass, aka more. He doctored my mother, and when he got the material out of her, he gave it to my grandpa, told him to throw it in the wind. And when he came back in, he had a little white fish, and he got it, and he blew it into my mother. And he told my grandma and grandpa, this little baby is going to live to be an old, old, old lady. And when she goes on, they're going to find that little fish. I put a lot of faith in the ability that Mahio gave that old man to doctor my mother because we bring her home just yesterday after a bout with pneumonia. As Cheyenne, we're always uh, thankful in that spiritual realm. Uh, offer thanks every day. Uh, try to try to maintain that spiritual contact. But the reality of it is, while well, Mom is in the hospital, she was how they say talking to talking to uh, her mom, her dad. And in that sense, it scares some people. But in another sense, that taught me and my daughters that this life we're living right now is just temporary. That spiritual life is forever. So that's, that's as a Cheyenne, I feel really humble that I was brought up that way to acknowledge things like that and try to pass them on. Thank you for sharing that story. <clears throat> what is your first memory of seeing art? My first memory or negative art. as an adolescent um, Southern Plains Museum and Anadarko lived about three blocks from there. And I would go there, and I'd go in, I'd look at the stuff, and I was always attracted to Cheyenne cultural items. I saw them, and in that adolescence, I had a feeling that they did belong to someone before they got there. How did they acquire them? You know, it's 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 like some of the things we as Indian people have is an innate feeling about things. And then as I got older, I traveled, go to museums, I'd see these wonderful cultural items behind museum glass, and there was no chance of the curator or, or you know letting me look at them and touch them until a few years ago. Um, through uh, First People's Fund. I got to go up to the Denver Art Museum, I got to go in the basement, oh my gosh, my dream came true. I got to see all of the Cheyenne cultural items, some that was collected at Sand Creek, and knowing the history of it, and knowing the people that, that made those things, knowing that they understood those things greater than I did, and it was, it was such a privilege to see things that maybe some of my relatives made back then. Some of the Lakota work is there because people think I'm, I'm Cheyenne, but I'm by him Kiowa too, but I'm also Sioux by blood. So that's my recollection of first artwork. <clears throat> What's your first memory of making art? First memory. In Anadarko, I had to have been about 10, 12. I found a piece of wood and got a pencil and I started drawing. And I drew an eye and it was very, very good. It, it was, I went, wow, I did that. And that, that's my first recollection. Um, my first recollection of adult 
artwork as far as beading goes. I always wanted to learn how to bead. And my mother, Ruby, she was known for her beadwork, her moccasins, her, her leggings, her uh, ladies' dance purses, her man's dance belts. And I came to her one time and said, Mama, 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 why don't you teach me to bead? And I brought her a handful of mismatched, different sized beads, and she just <laughs> laughed at me. And um, she did. She did show me, but that's 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 where I got my start as a adult, as far as the traditional aspect of it. The other things that I do, there was no way to learn. There was no way to have someone tell me you do it this way and you do it this way you do it this way as part of that cognitive process you look at something and you figure it out and you think it's about like this and you think it's about like this and after you try it you develop it becomes second nature you just do it uh, as as a production artist sometimes I to speed up and for inventory I have like patterns and I do all my rough cut, but everything I do is, is a single um, artistic piece because it's all drawn individually and painted, you know, so. Yeah, I wondered if you could talk, because, you know, cultures are always evolving and changing, and, you know, in, back maybe in the 40s and 30s when there were all the beading circles and, you know, people sort of discouraged the idea of men beating. Can you talk about how, when that started to change maybe? And, and of course it depended on families too. I, I think among the Cheyenne, the, there was the uh, beating gills, if you will, of the women. And it was really unusual for a male to do um, the beating. We have a buckskin shirt that belonged to my grandpa John that was made in 1899. It was made by more cut grass for my grandpa. It's still, the buckskin is as soft as it was made yesterday. And it's in that bright yellow Cheyenne smoke buckskin. You don't see that buckskin anymore. There are other men among the Cheyenne that, that, that did do beadwork uh, early on before I started. And, um, I can't think of their names right now, but it slowly evolved and when I started, I, I started out on making Native American church items, fans, uh, gourds, uh, and I was taught by like different ones. This is uh, an example of uh, one of the things I do. It's going to be a peyote gourd. Uh, it has the um, purple heartwood beaded with size 13 cut beads, a uh, single bead uh, with the colored gourd stitch. I have the birds. I do my own lathe work. As, as you develop these things, you, you start from just a piece of wood, then you go down. As far as beading the other things that I've done, I've done buckskin dresses. I've done a, I did a really beautiful buckskin dress for my ex-wife. and. It took me about 11 months, and my mother showed me how. Gladys Parton showed me how to cut it out. I've done moxins, leggings. I've learned from different ones. The technique of beading, I picked up from my mother, and she would take me to different relatives of hers so they could tell me how to do the right cuts and that type of thing. Uh, two ladies that really encouraged me uh, as far as the beading aspect. One was Bertha Little Coyote. Another one was um, Evelyn uh, White Crane. Uh, they're both my mother's aunts. And uh, over a period of time, your skills develop. Uh, the abstract thought process, you look at something and you claim ownership and you modify it and you make it your own. And um, over the years, uh, the ledger work that I do, a lot of people have told me that, you know, people copy my work, but I think that's really flattering and complimentary, <laughs> you know. Uh, I've, I've done book covers, I've been in uh, Native People's Magazine, I've, I've done, done um, 
uh, all types of uh, all types of work, and uh, it it's 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 always evolving. Even even today, my work is evolving. It um. um Everything I do evolved. Uh, mm -hmm. One of one of the things I like to really, really well. We'll save that for later. Let's go to the next question. Okay. Um, so pretty much your art experiences, aside from that, making that eye <laughs> in in at Riverside, you know, in in mm -hmm. middle school or high school, they weren't too significant. Nothing stands out in your mind. Nothing, nothing really, really stands out until my basically young adult life. I actually, it's like I had a need, I, I had a need, I had a desire, I wanted to learn. I wanted to, to learn about my Cheyenne people, what they did, how they lived, the history, the culture. The traditions, the songs, uh, why they did this, uh, why they use this color. I did something one time for my daughter Helen, that that stays here. And well, Heather, Helen, Holly, and Hannah watched my mother really good. But I made a smoke buckskin shawl for my daughter Helen. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really proud of it. It had buckskin fringe on it. It was, it looked like um, uh, what they call teepee liner. It was beautiful, and I went. And I happened to use a version of a mili Cheyenne woman's military stripe design that had some black in there. And they said, why did you use black for Cheyennes? are supposed to use bright, pretty colors. And after that, I'm really cautious about using black. I, I use it sparingly so that that was a learning experience but she still has that shawl today and uh, I haven't ever seen another mm. beaded buckskin shawl. Now you you did go to college where did you attend school? I started out here in El Reno at the junior college when I was up at the old post office downtown and after I graduated from here uh, I transferred to OCU in Oklahoma City and um, finished up. Um, what was your major? Education. I wanted to teach and I got the opportunity to teach after I graduated. I taught fourth and fifth grade uh, in an open classroom at a concho and I was out there for like 14 years and wow. I was on adjunct staff at OCU for for three years and then when I worked for Indian Health Service I was a community intervention specialist and I was still teaching. I've done conferences all over the United States, I've keynoted conferences and it was always talking about our culture relevant to wellness, our culture relevant to domestic violence or culture relevant to uh, alcohol substance abuse and I was still teaching Wow! and I'm still teaching now where I work in mm -hmm. a different sense. So when did you sort of and you may always have been working sort of full-time and and also doing your cultural items and your beadwork, but when did you sort of start entering shows and, and getting, um, entering competitive shows with your work? Oh gosh, that's really, I really can't remember, but I remember going to the different shows and seeing the work there, seeing some of the work that won, and I thought that was really, really nice, and I thought, my work is just as good. And the first piece I ever entered, I think, was a miniature beaded Cheyenne Cradle. Um, Mom helped me with the design. She told me about the design. Um, she's taught me everything I know about beading. 
uh, the woodwork and stuff. I, I cut my own wood. Uh, it looked like uh, in the photographs, I've got a picture of it someplace, I'll grab it in a little bit. It looked like a full-size cradle. You couldn't tell the difference. And that one, best of show, but on the pieces. Was it uh, here uh, in Oklahoma? Uh, I believe Red at uh, Red Earth. I've won best of show at Cherokee. I've won uh, best of division in the market. I've gotten their governor's award. I've gotten, I, I, I don't really like expressing that part because you're not really supposed to talk about yourself like that. But behind me, that mm -hmm. skull up there, it, that's, that's my little, it, it's kind of heavy to lift. There's metals and ribbons, and but I, um, it's it's not so much the competition as it's showing what my history is, what my people did, and that's whenever I'm fortunate. The place I feel it's representing them. It, uh, it's a way of keeping their memory alive, and I'm not saying that to uh, sound any other way. That's just the way it is with me. Um, I believe in that spiritual aspect of self. I believe that uh, the good that you do comes back. I believe that you should help those that can't help themselves. I've helped a lot of people through my artwork through donations of it. I've donated it to American Cancer Society, American Heart Foundation, diabetes programs. Uh, donated my artwork for various posters all over. Uh, even some organization in D.C. Uh, and I'm, I'm honored when they ask me to do that because in a way that's teaching too the theme of my drawing. Uh, just, just uh, they're going to have a Sean Rappo HIV youth powwow coming up July or so. They asked me to design a t-shirt for them and uh, I'll show you the design a little bit later. It's, I got it in here, the one that's going to be on their shirt. But I've, I've uh, by doing that I can, you know, help people that I don't even know, you know. Um, at some point you decided to pursue a Master of Arts in teaching. What, what prompted that? I felt the need to, uh, like in our ceremonies, it's like in non-Indian society, you're in grade school, go junior high, graduate from high school, maybe go to junior college, go to college, get a bachelor's, get a master's. In our tradition it's that way. There are certain things that you do through our traditions that bring you up within that, that, that level. Priest being the upper level and different places down. I participated in our ceremonies five times. Uh, I'm, whenever asked, I paint, I, I sing uh, the drum, uh, help out any way I can. But as far as pursuing my masters in that regard, I felt that there were other things that I could learn, uh, different techniques yet. Just, just not that I've really used any of them, but having that appreciation of world art, the masters, the real man, you know, just, just having that appreciation for it. Um, and you talked about um, the importance for you of, you know, being able to, um, you know, actually handle and see and experience cultural items, you know, Cheyenne cultural items. I was wondering what your first important museum exhibit was and, and why it was important to you. Southern Plains Museum. 
because that's where I, I that's 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 where I found uh, that's where I found uh, pride that's where I found uh, humbleness that's where I found uh, memories yeah and you also um, did you deal with any galleries in Oklahoma very much during the 70s or 80s there was a gallery in Norman I don't remember what it was there was uh, um, the standard red earth gallery there was a uh, um, was gallery in uh, Santa Fe I can't remember the name of it <laughs> there's um, uh, up in Rapid City my, my works like all over right. um, I was your focus booth shows though and kind of or was it split between galleries and booth shows my my focus was uh, primarily I would say the booth shows um, it allowed me to meet other people It allowed me to make a lot of different friends It allowed me to trade for other people's work that I admired. Even Merlin has some of my work. I've got <laughs> yes, some of his got work. And, from you. you know, that's that's <laughs> how that's how it works. <laughs> and that is a fun thing about Yeah. Um and then you got an MBA in business. Did you already know you were sort of were you thinking about going into business for yourself at that point? I definitely thought about it uh, I thought if I went through that um, I probably might but it was good from the standpoint of marketing and sales and all of those things that you use as a independent artist you do your own marketing you do a lot of the MBA first chapter 101 stuff, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> the same all over. And and that is the hard part, I think. The the business part of art is sometimes yeah. the hard, hardest part. What what was what was difficult for you? Um I think Some of the collectors, from attorneys to doctors, they there there's there's different kinds of collectors. There's those that really appreciate it, your work, and they understand it. And then there's co those collectors that that think they're at a garage sale. That was the hardest part working mm -hmm. with those collectors. So I graduated didn't go to them anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to. Um, you had your own store for a while, right? Um, yeah, just, just, it, it wasn't for very long. It was just a try and it, it. And were you working a nine to five job while you had the store? Yeah, too? yeah. And it. What were the challenges of that? <laughs> uh, finding extra time to do the things you needed to do to make it a success and had my children they were younger then and it was just it was fun I, I think now that I'm an elder and um, I think I could do it I, I yeah I think I could do it primarily on my own inventory starting small I think I could do it getting other people's inventory like the other galleries do on consignment. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure I could, but I'm working again now, and I, I retired after, uh, after 29 years, uh, 29 weeks, 29 days from wow. an health service. So. <laughs> well, congratulations. Then I went back to work. <laughs> I'm going to take another drink, excuse sure. me.
we won first place at Santa Fe Indian Market here not too long ago, 2007, for a piece called Pipe Woman Purse. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit about your inspiration for that piece? I've got a picture of it back there. This is the you purse that you Hold were. it up just a bit more. For, yeah, there we go. This is the purse that um, you were talking about. Yeah. It can be found on uh, the website, uh, internet, type in Frank Sheridan Cheyenne Purse. You can also type in Frank Sheridan Cheyenne Horse Mask. But what this was, I've seen a lot of uh, purses that are were beaded and stuff, and I specialize in rawhide, and I specialize in drawing on rawhide. Rawhide's really hard to draw on because of the surface of the skin. It's like drawing on sandpaper. And in order to get a smooth line, you have to like sometimes make your heart stop and go so you don't shake. Mm. But what it was, I wanted to do something that was a little bit different that represented the Cheyenne-ness of what we do. And among our people, uh, there were ways for courting. And I've heard some of those stories. And uh, of course, I did a courting scene. And then on, on each side for, uh, uh, for balance, you know, as an artist, you know, you balance, I put two abstract par flesh designs from about 1880 something up at teepees at the top uh, he's playing uh, playing a flute for his uh, lady she's standing there in a shawl and her cloth dress and she has a parasol people would say how come you put parasols umbrellas well when they would go on raids they would come back and maybe there was a parasol or something and they would hand out the goods spray please and uh, that's why she had the parasol and it must be a serious courting because he's got trade goods on the ground, he's got a bucket, <laughs> he's got a horse there. And then on the sides of the purse, the strap going up, that's a uh, uh, rawhide lined, uh, has a red cloth backing on the back. I have simulated uh, tobacco ties, I have uh, old uh, eagle quarters, I have uh, it's beaded in that military stripe design, uh, all kinds of bells and whistles, so to speak. It has rolled fringe on each of the four corners, really long hand rolled fringe, bells. Uh, it's lined with calico, and um, there's a serrated deer dew claws on it. It's, it's a piece that, as I was working on it, I was listening to, in my studio, as, as you could tell when you came in, have all kinds of music going. And I was listening to some of our ceremonial music, mm -hmm. uh, some of the, the uh, from recordings from Cheyenne Sundance, and it just like kept going and going and going and going. And anyway, it's, it, it finally ended up finished, and uh, I was honored, I was honored to uh, uh, have won that. On, on the back side of this purse, there was a drawing of a Cheyenne dog soldier. Uh, sitting, sitting with one hip on a rock, uh, holding his bow, had his shield, uh, got that typical <laughs> Cheyenne Suave, you know, like, come on. So, but that, that was a privilege doing that. The strap on that was similar to, similar to this one. Oh, wow. Yikes. This is, uh, one that I use sometimes. It's got a version of the military stripe, the, Horse hair tassels. Um, on my stuff, I use actual tobacco and, and mm -hmm. things that we use on stuff I sell. I don't, it's just simulated. Uh, elk's tooth, uh, little turtle. Mm -hmm. Anytime I use a turtle, it's for my mother. She has a turtle collection that you would not believe. <laughs> and uh, actually, some other stuff I'll show you after a while will we'll be going along that direction. but. That's the uh, that's the purse. This is the cradle board I was telling you about. Yeah. Uh, hope you can see it. Mm -hmm. um, cut beads. Yeah. This 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 is what Mom told me how to be. Help me with the design. Uh, this is another example of my ledger drawing. Uh, after I won the award at First People's Fund a couple of years later, I donated one of my drawings for their program, and that's one of my drawings. So 
So I, I have fun doing that. I, anytime I'm asked, I, I'm, I'm more than glad to donate my work because um, it, it's blessed me. Um, as any artist financially, more recent, this past November, I was contacted by Ermel Her Mini Horses out of uh, museum in D.C. Smithsonian uh, National Museum. And to this day, I don't know how he found me because when I retired, I dropped out of sight. No one knew where I was. And he called me one day in my office out there and he said, um, explained it, and he said, I have a commission for you um, at $5,000 if you can do me uh, uh, five of your ledger drawings, no restrictions, however you want to be represented. And I'm like, okay. And that was a pleasure because the drawings I did were really representative of Cheyenne. I mean, I think they were the best drawings I ever did, and it was a $5,000 commission. And they were going to the National Museum? Yeah, the yeah, the permanent collection. And as a token of appreciation, I sent Mr. I gifted Mr. Her Many Horses uh, to my original ledger drawings. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about um, your approach to ledger drawings and, um, you know, they've been pretty popular. A lot of artists have been yeah. doing ledger art. My, uh, first of all, the, on my original, my, my old, old, old style contemporary interpretation, this is some of the paper that I use. It's out of mom's collection, what she has. Mm. Some of the actual ledger names that were written by the Indian agents as the Cheyennes turned themselves in and as they came in. And in those ledgers there there were some blank pages. My supply is really, really limited. In some of those pages there's places where the Indian agent or whoever was writing tested their pen to the back and you know I can use parts of those pages. But some of these some of these names on here <coughs> um, Henry Bear, uh, Thomas Bear above, uh, Bear behind. It's got his wife. It's got his children. Got his grandchildren, uh, dating back to uh, 1888, 1884, 18. So that's a type of that's a type of uh, uh, genealogy that uh, my mother does. And while we're on the subject of the uh, ledger drawings. This is one of my uh, ledger drawings. It's a uh, it's a Cheyenne warrior scene. The top rider has the traditional Cheyenne upright bonnet. He's carrying a lance. He has a ribbon flowing off of his uh, off of his war bonnet. He has on a uh, captured uh, uh, cavalry jacket that he took the sleeves off to make a vest. He's got armbands on, he's got his shield on, he's got his trailer of uh, rock cloth coming down with the uh, eagle feathers on it. His horse tail is wrapped with red cloth. There's uh, medicine feathers on his uh, horse's forehead. The bottom rider has a, a tailed war bonnet, basically the same thing, has his braids, has breastplate, uh, horse's tail, and the ears, the Cheyenne would split their pony's ears as a way of endearment. A lot of the other tribal ledger drawings, they don't do that. The Cheyennes were the only ones if you look at the old ones. But this, this, is, done, uh, uh, this is done with waterproof technical inks. Mm. I've used crayons as they were done with originally. I've used all, all types of material. Uh, this is mainly the work I'm known for. It's in a traditional style, but my contemporary adaptation of it. Another one of my uh,
this is one that I need to paint. This is a battle scene. It's uh, six Cheyenne warriors, uh, various state of riding horses. Some of them carry coup sticks with eagle feathers, enemy lances, the straight up war bonnet, the horse tracks. It's in that style of, of the original ledger drawings and as you can see the pipe woman signature. Right. And uh, sometimes I'll do my my drawings with half horses coming out here because you know that's the way they were done. Another one real quickly. This one was a t-shirt design that I need to paint. Oh, it's a Cheyenne good. Warrior, the abstract uh, parflesh designs on the side. The two tracks are buffalo tracks. He's carrying a crook lance. He has a captured saber hanging in front of him. He's got his uh, bow case uh, decorated with ermine tail, eagle feathers, again, signed Pipe Woman. Very nice. This is one that I drew and donated to uh, um, Nancy Johnson uh, is is a social worker with Indian Health Service and she's been working with uh, Gloria Zuniga out at Cheyenne Arapaho Tribes and Nancy put some money with Gloria's program HIV money and part of that money they're going to use to sponsor this youth powwow mm. and they asked me if I would donate a drawing for their t-shirt so this is going to be the uh, drawing for the uh, Shine Repo Youth HIV Powwow. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one of my uh, contemporary style ledger drawings interpretation. This is normally how I do the abstract uh, parflesh design I have on there. This this specifically is part of a Cheyenne parflesh design. The ladies have Cheyenne smoke buckskin dresses. They have uh, parasols. Uh, there's there's the hair is, is so clean, it's shiny, that's the shiny streaks in it. Uh, the older, taller lady has Cheyenne crosses on hers. The smaller, younger child has mountains on hers. They have their uh, um, pouch sets, uh, knife case, all case. Uh, um, just, just, just. And then I did this within like two evenings because work, I had responsibilities of work and I knew it was coming up. That's called working under pressure. I'm sure yes, Merlin's done right. that before. Oh, that'll be a great, that'll be a great t-shirt. This is, it's one of my favorite interpretations. It's a Cheyenne dog soldier. Oh. Straight up war bonnet, his bow case. Larger ponies with split ears, that abstract parflesh design, mm -hmm. arrow sticking in the ground, captured enemy saber. Mm -hmm. That's gorgeous. And one more. Is. Oh, wow. The wording on here, this was a t-shirt design. What it is, it's a Cheyenne woman in a dentillium dress. Mm -hmm. Sleeves are beaded. She's holding a wing fan. Mm -hmm. There's willow leaves, willow branches on the side of her, uh, her camp behind her. Uh, there's dragonflies in the willows. Uh, she's sitting on a blanket. And the words in front of it are heaven, clouds, health, well-being exists. It is that way. Ma pia he chia, which on yellow hay hay hay. Ma pia he chia, which on yellow hay hay hay. He chia he chia, which on yellow. I Sioux word, Sioux song. Mm. That's the translation of it. Mm. Like someone gets well in sweat, someone's, someone's, you know, praying, you want them to get well. That's an example of the songs we use in sweat. Mm. But I've done this drawing 
one time before similar and I called it weights for him and what that was symbolic of was when my brother was in Vietnam he was a door gunner my mother as well as other Cheyenne mothers would pray and fathers and grandfathers go peyote meetings and the title of the drawing I did similar was called Waits for Him, mm. representing my mother waiting for her son to come home. Ledger drawings traditionally were done after exploits that the warriors did, uh, war exploits. Um, they were a way to, in our Cheyenne society today, you're not supposed to say anything unless it's that way. Traditionally in the drawings, they couldn't depict something if it wasn't that way. You know, it, it, it was a way of, they didn't realize it at the time, but it was recording history like we're doing with this. There's a lot of different interpretations, but that's some of my ledger drawings. I didn't mean to go that long, but... <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> um, you know, when you were nominated for that First People's Community Spirit Award, and it goes specifically to Native artists who are really community-centered and involved with their communities, um, you, were in, you were nominated by another bead artist, Terry Greaves, who's a very well-known bead worker as well. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find out you were nominated? Got a letter from First People's Fund. Mm, you didn't know. <laughs> no. Yeah, they they said the selection was based off at the time um, when I was working for in the health service. I worked. Me and Nancy Johnson and Harold Bars worked with a group of Vietnam combat veterans that were in outpatient treatment for combat-related post-traumatic stress disorder and we would meet with them twice a week. And it takes a while before any of the veterans in that group would really open up, but over three, four years that we worked with them, they uh, got real close. We'd, we'd, we'd sit with them, listen to them, their stories, hear them cry, hear them pray. We'd have sweats for them pretty regularly. And that was the basis of being community oriented. And two years later, Nancy was nominated for that same reward by me mm -hmm. for basically the same in working with, with that combat veterans group. And I've got a lot of respect for veterans. I'm not a veteran myself. Uh, my uncle recently passed. He was a Korean War veteran. He participated in Pork Chop Hill. And my youngest daughter Hannah's in the Navy right now, so that that uh, flag you see hanging there, that blue star, mm -hmm. back in the during the uh, Second World War, you would see blue stars and gold stars, gold star, star mothers. So mm -hmm. anyway, I don't know how I got off my land, but <laughs> um, well, since you mentioned Hannah and her service, um, you told me a wonderful story about your beaded horse mask. Um, and let's maybe just start, and then it's taken this whole <coughs> journey since you made it. But um, you you started off winning a prize with that one too. Maybe can you just start with talking about that? And I uh, I'm the only Cheyenne artist I know that is making horse masks. My first awareness of a horse mask. I've got the book someplace and I can't can't recall. I've had a lot of things going on this past week. But there was a mask that came up for auction that was found in a book. <coughs> Pardon me. And the provenance on it, it was made by a Cheyenne woman for her husband. And there's an actual photograph of that mask on a horse. I believe you might know what I'm referring to. I've got it in one of my books up here. Can we take a real pause?
pause real quick. Yep, yeah, sure. I'll grab the book. My first association with Cheyenne horse mask came when I was looking on the internet and I saw this mask that was in a box and I tried to do some more research on it and then I found out about this book on uh, American Indian horse mask so I ordered it and in reading it reading about it I found that that mask was made by uh, there was a man his name was he bear it was made by his wife and her name was um, Buffalo Walla Woman and that really gave me pride because I had seen them before and <coughs> I didn't never knew how to make one no one ever said Frankie you make your mask like this you do this what I did at first um, and I've got one started someplace, but I don't want to pause no more. <laughs> what I did at first, I made a pattern. And then I, uh, with that pattern, I went up to the vet and they had some horses. And would you mind if I tried this on your horse? <laughs> Why? Would you mind? So they let me and I modified my pattern to where it fit over the eyes. After I did that, I brung the mask back. And then that cognitive process. How is a mask made? Well, one it's got to be on buckskin two it's got to be decorated and looking at some of these I found one really 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 similar to the one I did and what I liked about it was the fact that it had uh, all of these antique buttons on it military jacket buttons mm. and I'm known for using antique military jacket buttons this is this is the one that okay, yeah. that I saw. So that was inspiration. That mask you can see on the internet. Type in Frank Sheridan Cheyenne horse mask. I beaded it after I beaded it. I thought, what's next? Well, you got to put the horns on there. <sighs> People say, when you do horns, use glass. No. <laughs> you got to use power tools and I had a grinder and it took about three hours seriously just to get the outer layers off and get it kind of smooth and then sand it smooth again and then after that cutting it and then after cutting it cutting it off and the interesting about horn when you cut it right down the middle you've got a duplicate image if, if the horns curving this way when you do the other side, those are the horse masks up there. <coughs> so, wow. no one showed me how to put them on. I figured out how to put them on, how they had to have put them on. The next step was, there's more to it than that. So, I found that on a horse mask, there's the front panel, that, the front part where the eyes and beadwork right. and horse is. There's two side panels where the fringe and everything is on both sides, and then there's a nose panel. Put those on after that was all done. Well, you can see all the all the backside. That's not good. I took it to a seamstress and asked her if she could sew red material on there. Mm -hmm. So she did the red material for me. Then I brought it back. And then I sat, this, this is, I've had this table 40 years, okay. <laughs> it's an old um, Sundance table that we left out and it worked and I put a piece of plyboard on it. So anyway, I got my Sundance paint and used the colors on it, just like you see up there, the red, mm -hmm. green. Mm -hmm. And um, did the tie straps. It was done. Uh, Showed it a few places. It was on the internet. It's still listed as ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. What I wanted. I had two serious offers for eight thousand, but you know, no, because of the thing of there's those collectors who think they're at a garage sale. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's not a garage sale. It took a while. Then my aunt Eloise, uh, um, you know her, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she had a memorial dance for her mother, Grandma Elsie and she wanted to use Hannah as honored veteran 
So we told Hannah, Hannah, Hannah came home. And the Cheyennes were taught, one, when you honor someone, give the best you have. Give the best you have. So we got all the other stuff, the shawls, the Pendletons, everything. And then I got my daughter here, and I got my mom and her sisters, and I got that mask down. I said, Hannah, I love you very, very, very much. I'm going to give this away for you. Daddy, no, Dad. It's going to be that way. So we go to the dance. She brings colors in and all that. I also gave away, when they give away, used to give away rifles, they would give away 22s. I'm the first one that gave away a semi-automatic assault weapon with a bayonet on it. I did that. I've seen that happen before. For Hannah, the other thing, Two things I gave away, the best I had. I gave away that brand new SKS to Eddie Wilson because on the staff that Hannah carried, this family staff, Kirk mm -hmm. staff, mm -hmm. <coughs> behind my bustle, there's an enemy NVA helmet that was picked up at Yawdrain Valley. I had that on there as a war trophy. Eddie Wilson was a medic at Yadrang Valley. Mm -hmm. He survived it. After that and all that, before I gave away that mask, I called Eddie up, had someone carry it around, traditional Cheyenne style, holler four times. Presented, he cried. Because I told his war story for him. And then my daughter, I said, I've got something very special to give away for my daughter, Hannah Shaila Sheridan. I'm very proud of her. Her grandmother, her sisters, very proud, her aunt. At this time, the person I'm going to call is not here, but we want to honor him. And because he's not here, we're going to mail it to him. At this time, I would like a representative for, <coughs> pardon me, my allergies, Philip Whiteman Jr., come up and receive this gift, and people went. At that dance, uh, the last item to be given away for Hannah Shaila, my daughter, who's in the Navy, stationed in Florida. She's a master at arms. When the ships go out and she's on a, a boat, uh, she mans the twin fifties, she likes that. <laughs> but I I called out, I said, at this time, like a representative for Philip Whiteman Jr. from Montana, come shake hands with my daughter and receive this gift. And people were just shocked because uh, you give your best, that's how I'm taught. You give your best. You gave away a brand new it was AK forty seven with bayonet. And that mask and I told him he's not here, so we're going to mail it to him. So I got pictures of Hannah holding it and all that. <laughs> and then we took her to the city squirt camp and had it packaged. And she wrote a little note in there and we mailed it and told Philip, you know, why I did it. And in turn, he thanked me and all that. And this dance was, I think, it was in the fall. And then Denver March coming up, it was a little before that. Philip's daughter, stepdaughter, him and his wife, I forget her name, but she had just come back from her second combat tour in Afghanistan. She's a warrior woman. In turn, Philip gave that mask away for his daughter at Denver March powwow. He put that mask on a pony, led it into the arena. And I wasn't there, but he and other people told me, you could have heard a pin drop. Okay. That's what Cheyennes are taught to do. 
some people might interpret that as you're just showing off or no it's what are you willing to give to get what you ask the creator for I'm willing to give when I prayed for my mother that she come home I told Mahio I'm willing to give part of my life that my mother can come home again that's what we're taught as Cheyenne with that same concept that's what I did with 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 Hannah giving that away uh, I'm the only one that I know of that makes these masks I've got two others up there the one in the middle is where I had that but I was offered eight thousand dollars two times for it and I didn't do it yeah. and I have another story when I went to Idle Jord I did a uh, Cheyenne boys bow case similar to this one mm. this is this is the strap that's going to go on it mm -hmm. and it was beaded and decorated same thing it won first best category whatever it was it won so when a man came by twice first time how much let him look at it he said he'd be back the second time he came by he said, I have $8,000 cash. I'll give you for that bow case. And I said, sir, I really, really appreciate it. He showed me $8,000 cash. I said, but I can't. I'm sorry, I have to have 10. And he said, if I go, I'm not going to come back. I said, well, I appreciate it very, very much. That Christmas, I gave that to my grandson because mm -hmm. I've got my grandfather's shirt in there. That's my prized possession. Someday that bow case with the ribbons and everything that went with it, that's going to be my grandson's prized possession. And he's 14 now and that was, he was still a little kid. That's part of that, 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 in a sense, these are like material things, but it's a gift that God gave me, and to show him I'm thankful for that gift, I give. We had a sweat here for one of our, uh, my daughter or someone, and I had a mate to this knife. This is a Cheyenne bear jaw knife. Someone came to pray for I think it was my daughter when we were sitting down here eating those kind of sweats we give away I said we've got a visitor here that came long ways to pray for my daughter at this time I want him to come up and accept it was the other knife case from my daughter mm -hmm. and my daughter just went but that's mm -hmm. she got well that's what I was willing to give I'm not anyone special I, I just that's the way I was taught by my mother that's hopefully going to recuperate more in there from the story she told me from Sand Creek about her mom about her grandma about her dad about her mother about her brother I'm just thankful to my uh, that She's home. Uh, we're going to work with hospice starting Monday. And as long as I have her, I'm never going to leave her. She's my queen. That's how come I dropped out. I don't do shows anymore. I've got someone very, very special in there. I was telling my daughters, uh, if this was a long time ago and our camp was attacked and your grandma got hurt or got shot, you would tell the man, Helen, you would tell Tommy, take Christian and Hayden, go on, I'll be okay. Holly, you would tell your man, 
take Hazel, take Harper, you'll be okay, go on. I'm going to stay with my grandma. And you girls would have grabbed her. <coughs> you would have taken her off in the brush someplace, protected her. I said, that's what you're doing right now. That's what you're doing. You may not realize it. You didn't leave her. Philosophically, traditionally, we look at things differently. And uh, that's just like I've been ordering some books for... Uh, now I'm an elder now. <laughs> um, really good books that I know of for my daughters. I knew this lady. She would come over and visit my grandpa and they would sit outside and drink coffee and talk in Cheyenne. She lived two streets down. I knew Joe, I knew Clark, I knew his brother. I knew uh, uh, Kathy, I knew Maude. There's a picture. I have a photograph that was taken at Southern Plains Museum of my mother in a buckskin dress, two other ladies in a buckskin dress, Mary Inkinish in a buckskin dress. I've got that picture. I've ordered another book, the set of this. I had the originals. Someone borrowed them and never returned them. I'm never going to loan my books again. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I've learned, I passed it to a lot of people. Uh, when mom recently in the hospital, uh, years ago there was a Northern Cheyenne man, he was mom's grandpa, Wesley White man. He was the last Cheyenne contrary. When he passed away through his family, he told them that he had some medicine that he wanted me to have it. And I asked around first because I was kind of scared of it. I asked Roy uh, Bullcoming and others. And Roy said, I, 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 I know what that old man has. He must think a lot of you. He said, take it. And when I did take it and they gave me his pipe and I took it up to the hospital, stood in front of mom, prayed with it handed it to her. She looked at it, she went. Then she looked out her window, she held it out. I told you she had one foot over. She said, this is my grandfather's medicine. He wanted Frankie to have it. Frankie's helped a lot of people with it. Maybe he can help me with it. And then she closed her hand. And she doctored herself with it. She don't know how to do that. But uh, traditions like that. I don't normally tell that story. But uh, it is a strong medicine. I make pipes for people. My grandpa Alan, a long time ago, made my first pipe. Alan Bushyhead, I was really proud. He said, uh, don't make any more just yet. He said, I'm going to take you somewhere. Uh, next week he come over, he said, get in. He took me to Longdale to see that uh, red hat, that old old man arrow keeper. And he talked to him in Cheyenne and on the way up there he was telling me, a long time ago there were certain people in our tribe who used to make these. They're very powerful. He said, I love my, my grandchildren, my children at the time. I don't want anything happened to him, I'm going to take you to this arrow keeper, ask permission. And he got a grocery basket and all that, and I had an extra pipe, he took me up there. And he talked to him in Cheyenne, and uh, looked at the pipe I made. When I sundanced back in 70, 71, 72, 73, and 85, the pipe I used, I made myself. Mm. I still have that pipe. My son's pipe, when he went in, I made it. The pipe that Holly's going to use, I made hers. Anyway, 
my story, that old man looked at it, and he talked in Cheyenne to Grandpa Allen, and then he looked at me, he said, your grandpa's right. Just certain people used to make these. He said, I'm going to give you permission to make them for our ceremonial people. He said, when you make them, just pray for that person you're making it for, and through that you'll get a blessing. I don't tell that story, but I was given permission to make pipes by that old man Red Hat. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do a little bit of everything. Um, it's all a spiritual process. Whenever I'm doing work, I like go into that place where these things belong. Even, even through the music I listen to, sometimes I need to get away from that place that gets a little strong, so I put on my reggae or my Motown and <laughs> rent a little town rub uh, back here by myself dancing, <laughs> and then I get back to it. But one of the things that Morning Stars Camp, Battle of the Washita, like they say in the movies, mm -hmm. after they raided these places, all those things of Cheyenne beauty got them and they burn them. I'm trying to keep a little of those those uh, people alive. I, 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 I never really call myself an artist. I, I don't. It's just something I do. My children are picking it up. My daughter Helen my grandson Christian made a box at Red Earth last time I did it years ago. He went first place in it. Uh, all my children can do something. Um, it's just something I really, really enjoy doing. And I believe that I was destined to do what I do, but Mama had to be part of it. And everything happened when it was supposed to happen and through the stuff I do. Let's just pick it up with, um, uh, you know, th that nobody else is making these. Yeah. This um, is something. There, there's burial flag display boxes, the wooden ones and all that. Right. But uh, our Indian boys, they fought. Uh, this is something from the heart that, that's traditional and my brother's flag is laying on a bed of sage recently Sam Hart's widow Dolores Hart had a birthday and I had just finished one and I asked his daughter who I work with Jenny what was his rank I knew he was in the Marines uh, not Marines uh, Corman. Anyway, I wrote United States Marines, Samuel, his middle, middle initial heart, when he was born, when he passed away. I put it in a nice, nice gift bag, put a bow on it, called her daughter, told her to give it to her mom for her birthday. That's, 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 that's what we're taught to do, give. And maybe through that, maybe God remembered that, and that's how come my mother got to come home. Maybe all these things I've donated, God remembers, and he's given my mother a little more time. Maybe he's going to help me with my back. If I had to do my back surgery again, I would. But I, I know I'll never be the same. I'm limited in what I can do, but I thank God I can do what I can do. And still do my artwork. Um, it's always a privilege and an honor to do anything relating to our Cheyenne people. Next question. Well, um, you've said so many good things. In the, I uh, guess I just would would be whatever you'd like to add that you don't think we've covered. In um, 
the corner by the TV back here. I'm gonna, you probably can pick me up, but I'm gonna go back there, then I'll come back up here, so just leave your camera running. Okay. I'll talk loud. Okay. There's a item that you see standing up by the TV. Mm -hmm. There's a black handkerchief hanging on it. It's beaded, it's over eight foot long. Wow. Um, when I was at the Denver Art Museum, there's a that that's on the websites that that supposedly is a Cheyenne dog soldier sash, but in that museum it says Cheyenne question mark Arapaho question mark Sioux question mark. Mm -hmm. No one actually knows, and I was a mentor to Nancy Johnson. She does some beautiful beadwork. I've, I've mom adopted her in our family. She gave her a Cheyenne family name, uh, Hestakia, twin woman. She's a mother of twins. Um, we did a joint project through her First People's Fund Award. Uh, she got the materials to make two Cheyenne style soldier sashes, dog soldier sashes. Uh, it took over a year on and off. Um, it's lined on the back with red material. There's symbolic things on it. There's medicines on them. She did hers to honor her dad who was uh, William Jimmy. He was Choctaw Chicksaw and during the Korean War he was a machine gunner, and he fought at uh, uh, Port Chop Hill. And when I was doing mine, I was doing it to represent my brother, Johnny Botong, who's, and to honor my uncle, who I'm named after, Frank Thomas Sheridan. And in doing the research, I we found out that Nancy's father fought at Pork Chop Hill. He never told anyone. We found that out. I found out that my Uncle Frank fought at Pork Chop Hill. He never told anyone. We found out and we made these sashes. Down at the bottom, you can come up and look at it closer when I go up there. There's even that earth peg that they stick themselves to the ground with. This. Uh, Warrior sash is similar to one that's in the uh, Denver Art Museum. And as I said, mine was done to honor my brother Johnny Botone, my uh, uncle Frank Thomas Sheridan. And now that my daughter's in the military, she wasn't at the time, it honors her down to the earth peg when they stick themselves in. Among warriors, Cheyenne, dog soldiers, they would uh, make a vow if they were in dire straits, peg themselves out and make a vow to fight there. Some other cultures do that, some of the eastern cultures do that, tie their legs up and stuff. but. Uh, the interesting part about this, there was two made. The other one is, if you put them both together, you couldn't tell who made them, me or Nancy. Wow. And the thing about it, we had permission. And what she was going to do with hers, we was going to put a teepee out here. We was going to call uh, chiefs and societies and feed them. And she was going to give hers to the dog soldiers. Mm -hmm. They don't have one. So we were going out to see, I'm just going to say it, he's my brother Chester. We was going to set it up, tell him about it. In fact, took it out there for him to see. He said, nope, they don't want it. What? They don't want it. If 
if they want one, we'll go get the one out of the museum. Made Nancy cry until I want to tell you what. That one's yours now. Belongs in your family. Part of that tradition that my family gave her, she was expressing it through that gift. That was going to be her horse mask that she gave to the dog soldiers to honor her father who's passed away. They stepped all over it. So, sometimes happens that way. I don't know if they were jealous or she was a different tribe. We went through our own little ceremony in doing the starting prayer, putting out food. Different reasons was you don't know the ceremony. So what? Who of these priests know every ceremony back? In naming ceremonies, Sundance isn't the only place you can do them, you know. You can have your private ceremonies. They missed out. It's just like this. They did. They did. We have a lot of warriors in the military. My son's a dog soldier. I gave this one to him. Mm. No one knows that story. I was there, I saw it. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't that way, I wouldn't say it. Mm -hmm. But I know my brother, and I don't know his reasons other than, nope, they don't want it. She was going to feed them, mm -hmm. pay for everything, give them gifts. So that's the story yeah. behind this. That's the story of that tradition, passing on tradition, trying to be, live a traditional lifestyle and for whatever reason someone, it was a gift. Mm -hmm. Hours and hours and hours and expense and prayer and prayer and prayer. It was like, your prayers weren't good enough. Maybe, maybe that person, I, I love him, he's my brother. Maybe he's just knows something I don't know. I can't say. Who am I to say? Well, that's the story behind this, and I wouldn't say it if it wasn't that way. Um, I've got a lot of respect for him. Just like Gordon, uh, the day before Mom came home, Helen went over to his house. He'd come up and he doctored Mom mm -hmm. with uh, red material. Uh, she came home the next day home right now. So that's the story of Frank, Pipe Woman, Sheridan. Oh, I also do Woman Saddles. Oh, Cheyenne Saddle. Yeah, okay. I've beaded one before and let's see. You got a picture in there? I believe I do. And I think uh Frank, I'll just reposition this so I can take a look at the the saddle that's unbeaded up there. Rawhide saddle. Oh yeah, I got a good look at it. Yeah. It's not a very wow. good picture, but there it is. One that okay. I beaded before. Okay. Let's to see. Zoom, zoom. Yeah, I'm gonna on. zoom in here. Let's see. And the, the, oh, I see it, yeah. The buckskin shirt next to it, that's the reproduction of my grandfather's shirt in the bedroom in there. Right. I sold that one to five dollars for $5,000 to a collector out of uh, Colorado. Ah. Uh. And I'm at the point now to where I'm not selling any more of my better works. I'm keeping them mm -hmm. for heirlooms. I've, I've, yeah. I've won, I've placed, I don't need to do that anymore. Right. Know? I will eventually. I'm glad that they are going to your family. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Frank.